Thank you, Lynn, and uh, I'm going to focus on the aspects of the facilities in terms of buildings and places and spaces that we commonly call uh, the built environment. Um, I'm going to address the issue of the uh, role of new builds and some um, uh, key issues to write about the discussion of the role of new builds, but I'm also going to focus heavily on retrofitting in relation to the existing stock, make some points about governance and also about our potential in the construction industry and how we might need to shift those. And finally, talk about uh, the role of government um, leading in relation to its own estate, its own uh, building and uh, its own work environment. The young people, the old where that targets have been set for all new house buildings to be zero carbon by 2016, and to have the equivalent target for a non domestic building by 2019. Uh, I think we've got concerns over how that will affect the ACFT within the time scale, particularly given the time of time is. But one thing that the report particularly focused on is whether those standards are actually being implemented, enforced, and monitored. We look particularly at the role of building regulations here, and it's the state of science uh, review looking at the role of biggest building regulations. And here the report draws attention to the need for more resources and more attention, particularly to enforcement and to monitoring. We noted uh, problems over the way that the modelling of energy use in the building regulation works, uh, the differences between that modelling, the way that energy is actually performed once they're built, and how they actually perform after they've been in occupation for a while. So then again, that seems to be another shift in terms of level of energy use. But at the end of the day, what we're concerned is how those built environments and buildings are performing over the medium to longer term not how they're supposed to uh, be uh, performing um, on the designer's um, template. We're also uh, taking very much on board the fact that, uh, as Sam has been saying, energy behaviour is absolutely crucial. While we want to say that uh, new dogs have a role to play and the design and construction of that new is very important, we have to recognise that the evidence shows that occupier behaviour is at least if not strongly dependent on energy use than building design. And so for both of those reasons, we particularly want to draw attention to the report the importance of retrofitting our existing stock and not relying on a campaign of new bills alone to meet the carbon um, energy reduction target. One of the key statistics that comes out is that about 70% of weddings that um, will be standing in 2050 have already been built. The turnover rate in the non-domestic stock is slightly higher, but even so in the non-domestic stock also, we are primarily dealing with an old stock now, and in 2050 we will still be dealing with an old stock. About a quarter of our commercial space now has been built before 1940. Only 15% has been built since 1990. That's taken by area, by a certain interest. So we need to recognise that in the future we will be dealing continually with a large portion of the built stock that already exists, that's already been built, and that is performing poorly. It was not built at the time that energy uh, efficiency was a key concern, and it hasn't been built to a high level of energy performance. So what we need to look at is the ways in which we can actually retrofit the existing stock in order to increase its energy performance. Uh, in a, in 2006 level of energy performance of uh, dwellings, of housing, is about 300 uh, kilowatt hours per meter square. German technology and a public house program has shown that we can reduce that to 15 kilowatt hours per meter square. Now that may come at a cost, and they may not, you know, they're not clear that every house has to be a public house, but it's clear that we can radically increase the energy performance of the existing stock. What we also look to is the role for local government, perhaps, to take on board uh, and introduce area safety, looking back to some of the ideas, ideas of area improvement schemes back in the 60s and 70s, and tailoring them to the specific uh, purpose of increasing the energy performance of the local stock. That is, to increase community involvement, it's to find new ways to share the cost of that retrofitting investment. The time of the it's very difficult to get the millions of individual building owners and occupiers to invest in this kind of technology, but perhaps local an area based approach would be an enhanced role for local government. On government generally, what we want to say is there is no single bullet that will work, a magic bullet. What we need is government systems to promote decarbonisation through a judicious mix of regulation, fiscal measures, 
and proactive area-based planning by local authorities in the way we the possibility of encouraging innovation at the local authority scale in energy systems to be highlighted into area-based improvements. We could see quite an exciting role here for the local government uh, sector. One particular um, potential idea that the report has suggested is the idea of introducing frequent, possibly annual assessments of the building's energy performance which would be linked in time to minimal allowable standards. Now, we think this might be an interesting way of promoting change for a number of reasons. Firstly, it's a way of making building owners and building occupiers think about their building performance on a regular basis. The current energy performance certificate, the current housing information tax, only work at certain points in time and have a very long lifetime on a building certificate. What we want to get people to think about is more regularly and think about how they could change that. And we're to, to get this to drive forward change, we see those kinds of systems, particularly in your package, if we include, include increased subsidies to encourage take up and other kinds of specially designed package that we deal with on the problems that Simon highlighted uh, in retrospect, we both have a happen factor, misperception, lack of trust in the schoolers and what have you. But we also see it as being linked to perhaps regulation and signal three or five years down the line. So people are aware that if they don't improve their energy performance, they've got the information and they've got the support to do that. If they don't do that, the regulation will kick in down the line and we could have a minimum amount of standards, we could have those standards linked in building insurance, the ability to get building insurance, for example. So this is a kind of package measure that government should be thinking about in order to get change to happen. Talking about the construction industry, it's clear that there are very strong class dependencies within the construction industry. And while uh, a CGP has an uh, industry that's capable of delivering new, innovative, more energy efficient buildings, that is only happening in certain sectors within the UK. So we do have some concern about the capacity of the UK construction industry to deliver on a pace and scale the report argues it was necessary. And we're arguing that it may be necessary to look at new commercial models. And these could include that the construction and development sector, particularly the development sector, became an estate in the operational life of the development. And there are two, two reasons for that. One is that because many of the kind of innovative um, energy systems, decentralized energy systems that Jim has been talking about, require long term management. Uh, it's not enough to go in, install them, and then get out. You need to have some responsibility and um, uh, liability almost to the continued working of those installations if they're going to continue delivering carbon reduction into the medium and long term. And secondly, those kind of innovations will deliver savings, but they do so over the medium term. And we need to find a way in which those savings can be factored into commercial decision making on a more short term uh, basis. Finally, we want to go to the role of government. Um, the government is very important in the built environment sector. They own a lot of buildings, they're tenants of a lot of buildings, they own a lot of land. Uh, that is across different government departments as well as different government agencies. And when we add that all together, we think there's a real potential here for the government to lead by example. Perhaps to take the idea of a building MOT or building annual assessment and to actually adopt that on a frequent basis. So we do recognise that the public sector is lived in a world of uh, auditing and of brain when things go wrong. And what we want to do from here is a need to overcome what will be a fear of failure. So we want the public sector to take on board some innovative ideas in construction, in facilities management, like adopting green leases, in decentralised energy. We have to recognise that some of those may fail. And we don't want the public sector to resist that kind of innovation because of fear of failing. We need to look all the things schemes and such and make sure that providing those evidence of learning that the public sector is not penalised for trying to actually reduce the carbon emissions in new and innovative ways. Therefore, if some fail, others will succeed, and those who be absolutely sensible for learning how to uh, and take a, a realistic path towards decarbonisation. And to drive the uh, work in the public sector forward, we think we need to have strong leadership to unify the uh, initiatives that are already happening in some departments and across some agencies, but we need to bring that together under strong leadership so that the government can actually show that it's doing decarbonisation on its own doorstep. Thank you very much.
Thank you.